Around 2.4 billion years ago, something very interesting happened to the Earth, which transformed it profoundly. Oxygen started to appear in its atmosphere for the first time. Before this time, the Earth's atmosphere was very toxic, and the only things that were alive were very simple bacterial cells that hated oxygen and fed on stinky sulfur-based materials. So when all this oxygen appeared, it killed off most of these cells, and it caused one of the most significant mass extinction events in Earth's history. So where did all this oxygen come from? It came from these, a slightly more evolved type of bacteria named cyanobacteria, named because of color. Now, at some point in time, the cyanobacteria decided that they didn't want a sulfurous diet anymore. They're sick of that. They grew a taste for something much more abundant and easy to find, water. So they developed the ability to photosynthesize. They could turn water and carbon dioxide from air into sugar and oxygen. They stored away all the sugar for later when the sun's not around, and they burped out all the oxygen because that was like a waste product for them. So having this new ability to be able to extract energy from its surroundings so easily meant that these cyanobacteria could thrive, and they're still alive today. They can be found in these mineral formations known as stromatolites in、um, Western Australia, and at some point in time, they've also been integrated into plants and algae cells.、Um, and in fact, it's thanks to them that plants and algae cells can photosynthesize today. So the reason that I'm telling you this story is because these cyanobacteria had an amazing energy revolution, and it's very similar to the one that we're trying to have right now. We would also like to be able to source our energy from things most abundant to us, and that's what I'll be talking about today: how we can achieve this using、uh, nature as our guide. So hopefully, most of us here in this room can appreciate why we need an energy revolution. So we're consuming more energy than ever before, and over 80% of that energy is sourced from fossil fuels. And we know that's non-renewable; it's going to run out one day. And the use of these fossil fuels is causing very adverse effects to our environment. And so clearly, our current energy diet is neither sustainable nor clean. And we need an energy revolution. To replace these fossil fuels with something better. So I guess less clear to us is why can't we have this revolution right now? What's stopping us? I mean, we have all of this very,、um, we have lots of renewable energy available to us. We've got all this sun and wind and hydro, etc. Why can't we have it now? Well, one of the problems with these types of energy is that they're very intermittent. Which means that when the sun is,、um, when the sun sets, or for example when the wind stops, then our energy supply also diminishes, and so they're very unreliable. And so that's why fossil fuels are so popular, because you know they're stored form. A fossil fuel is a stored form of energy in forms of chemical bonds, and so they can be transported,、um, they can be combusted whenever we want it. We want energy, so they're very convenient to use, as well as being very reliable. And in fact, if we look at how we use our energy, you can see only a minority of the energy that we consume is actually in the form of electricity, and the majority is actually in the form of a fuel, fossil fuel. And so, you see, if we want to succeed in our energy revolution, we can't just replace a fuel with electricity. We need to replace a fuel with another fuel that is more renewable. So, where do we get such a renewable fuel? I mean, where should we start looking? Well, as a scientist, most logically, we go for the most abundant source of energy. So, our sun. Our sun gives us. Um, can give us sorry. The sun gives us enough energy to power all our energy needs, 10,000 times over, and so it's a pretty good place to get our energy from. So if we can somehow convert that sun energy into a chemical fuel and use it、um, as a solar fuel, then we could have our revolution. So basically, what we want to have is、um, type of fuel, so solar fuel, where we can. 
basically use it the same way as a fossil fuel. So for example, we can store it, we can transport it, we can put it in our cars, we can combust it to generate electricity, so we can power our cities day and night whenever we want it. Um, the only difference would be that it will be sourced renewably, or sort of sustainably from the sun, um, as opposed to being mined from the earth. So this all sounds really fantastic, but how do we make a solar fuel? Like, what kind of inputs do we need and what kind of outputs do we want? And how do we make sure that it's renewable and sustainable? So luckily for us, there's actually a very good example of solar fuels being made in nature. So if you remember to, back to the cyanobacteria, how they carried out photosynthesis, they converted water and carbon dioxide into sugar and oxygen. So in this case, this sugar is actually the solar fuel. And so when, the good thing about this process is that when the sugar is consumed to release the energy, we get back water and carbon dioxide. So it's a very self-sustaining process. So scientists everywhere, including myself, are trying to now carry out artificial photosynthesis to make our solar fuels. But we don't want to make sugar. No, we want to make something smaller and simpler and that still be able to hold a lot of energy. Right now, we have our eyes on hydrogen. So hydrogen, you can see, we can get from water, the splitting of water. And the good thing about hydrogen is that when we combust it, we actually get back out water. So not only will it be very um, renewable, but it's also very clean. Now, again, this sounds really great, but it turns out that water is not so easy to split up. It's actually very stable, and it requires a lot of energy to break apart. And so to help you appreciate that, here is an energy diagram so you can see the energy barrier that we're facing. You can think of it as the water needing to, have, uh, needing to climb a very big mountain before it can descend down on the other side as our desired products. Now, because it's such a big mountain, we need a lot of energy. And so we can actually get this energy from the sun. So if the sun can provide the energy for this climb, then obviously this would solve some of our problems. Now, so part of the challenge in devising artificial photosynthetic device um, is to have something that can absorb sunlight and absorb it very well. Another challenge is to not uh, waste this energy on something else. So, for example, the water may get very overexcited and start climbing the wrong mountain um, and start going the wrong way, so basically participating in all these side reactions. So we need to somehow limit that. Now, to perform very difficult reactions like these, scientists can cheat a little bit. We can employ a mountain guide um, that knows a shortcut across the mountain so that the water can lead the water to the other side quicker. We call these mountain guides catalysts. So catalysts, we use these uh, catalysts to speed up reactions um, so that we can put in less energy and we get back out our products quicker. Now, um, so you can see, we, there's a lot of things we need to consider when we are doing these type of reactions, especially for, photos, uh, for water splitting. Now, we know that nature is actually a master at water splitting. It has to be to, in order to do photosynthesis. So now, since now we want to be the new masters of water splitting, we should really consult nature and see what it does and why it, how it does it so well. And so let's do that right now. So we know that photosynthesis is carried out in the leaf. So if we zoom up on the leaf, we can actually see it's filled with these green globules. Then they're chloroplasts. They're actually a, a relative to the cyanobacteria. And so you can see that it's got all these f um, heavily folded pockets. And if we zoom up on these pockets, we see that it's filled with these um, things. They're catalysts. They're nature's catalysts called enzymes. And so the fact that um, these pockets are so heavily folded, it's nature's way of squishing in, cramming in lots of catalysts in one spot. So this particular catalyst or, or enzyme is called photosynthesis, uh, photosystem 2. It's so big because it's filled with light absorbing material so that it can absorb as much sunlight as possible. So embedded in that tangle of mess in the bottom there is an amazing compound that actually does the water splitting. 
So you should notice, what I want you to notice from here is that it's made up entirely of Earth abundant materials. And that's how nature can afford to make so many of these catalysts. So this particular compound can actually split up to 1,000 molecules of water per second. So that's pretty amazing. OK, so now the question is, can we do something similar? Can we make our own device that sort of copies what nature does? So here's something that we've been making. So this, is, this actually is a prototype system developed by one of my colleagues in the, at the University of Cambridge. And following nature's rules, we made it entirely out of Earth abundant materials. So let me walk you through it. So here on the right side, we have a light-absorbing um, material made out of tungsten. And on the other side, we have a different light-absorbing material made out of copper. So in this case, we can actually tune the energy of light that we can absorb by choosing different types of materials. And in fact, if we find the right combination of materials, we can outperform nature and absorb more sunlight than nature can or than plants can. And this is the beauty of artificial photosynthesis, because um, we are inspired by nature, but we're not confined by it. So now if we zoom in on our material, you can see that we've actually engineered the surface to have all these really rough, these sheet-like surface um, morphology and all these um, rod-like morphology on the other side. And that's just to increase the surface area so that we can cram in as many catalysts as possible. So to do the water splitting, we employed a very simple um, tungsten-based catalyst. And to do the formation of the hydrogen, we uh, employed a very simple nickel catalyst. And so when we put it all together and we shine light on it, what we actually see is the water can be split and we do form hydrogen gas. So yes, we are actually able to make solar fuels from very earth abundant material. Um, so the question is, how efficient is it? So the, honor ans an sorry, the honest answer is, it's not as efficient as nature. But to be fair, nature's had a few hundred millions of years to fine tune its art. And we've only had a couple of decades. So we're actually very excited by this result. And so beyond this, what we want to do is not just stay with hydrogen. We want to be able to use sunlight to convert other abundant materials into other types of solar fuels and um, other types of useful materials. But unfortunately, today, I won't have enough time to tell you about it. Um, so hopefully. What I, I have managed to do today um, is to show you a new way of thinking in regards to how we can have an energy revolution. So as shown by our bacterial friends, all we really need is water, air, and sunlight um, in order to make a very sustainable fuel. Now, all we need is find, uh, for us, all we need is to find a better catalyst. Now, encouragingly, scientists have, have actually made some really great breakthroughs. We can make some pretty efficient systems already. However, they're made out of very expensive earth rare materials. And we need to really focus on making devices out of earth abundant materials if we want um, our energy revolution to be a widespread and sustainable one. So unfortunately, that's much harder to achieve. And there are big mountains to climb still. But it's definitely achievable, because nature has shown us that it's achievable. Thank you.